Hi, welcome to the Signal Path. It has been a long time since I've made a new video and I'm glad to be back. I've just been really busy with work and other things and I haven't been able to dedicate much time to the website. But rest assured, the website is alive and there's a lot of more interesting videos that will come in the future. And I've received a lot of really nice emails and messages from well wishes from all around the world asking me for new videos. And uh, I have a lot of cool experiments, some experiments that I'm sure no one else has ever done and some really interesting tutorials. So stay tuned, I promise I'm going to make more videos. And I thought today we'll start with something simple. I've picked up a, a new instrument from eBay that was broken and I thought we'll go through uh, the repair process, see if we can fix it and also go through this uh, principle of operation and how it works internally and take it apart and tear it down and look at some of the interesting components that are inside it. So here it is. I have bought an Agilent, a very heavy Agilent uh, synthesizer. This is a uh, 250 kilohertz to 3 gigahertz uh, real synthesizer. It's similar to the one that I have in my lab on the other side, which, you've, you, which we have used in some of the other experiments. But this one is uh, being written at, off as being broken. And I've paid about uh, $500 including shipping to my door, which is, you know, it's a little bit risky because if it's not repairable, that's a reasonably large investment, but uh, if it does work, it's worth uh, well more than that. So let's try and see uh, if we can figure out a way to fix it. Well, here's the front uh, of the instrument. So as I was saying, this is an ESG3000A model of the synthesizer, 250 kilohertz to 3 gigahertz. The A in this model stands for analog. This is one of the earlier models of this unit, and Agilin refers to the early models as the analog model, uh, probably because internally they do some things analog, which then later on uh, they've uh, been started to do it in a digital fashion. I'm not exactly sure which components those are, but anyway, we'll take a look at that. And you can see that it, has, it looks exactly like the one that I have in my lab on the other side. And unfortunately, you can see these connectors up here are all uh, damaged. And this actually happened during uh, transit. Uh, this wasn't the way it was advertised. And, and then unfortunately, they, uh, you, I think it was FedEx that dropped the box and crushed these connectors. So, well, that's a step backwards. We'll have to find a way to fix those connectors if we can fix the whole unit. So I'll do that at the very end. Uh, there's no point in trying to fix that if you're not able to repair the unit itself. So let me turn it on, uh, if I can get centered this. There we go. So let's see uh, what happens. So we plugged it in. Uh, startup screen. So far so good. It's checking the firmware and the checksum on the firmware. So that's, that's good. All right. Seems like it's booting up now. So you can see it's uh, anyway passed by was saying the ESU 3000A. So when it boots up, it was advertised as having two main problems. One problem being uh, the unlock symbol. You can see the unlock symbol right here that's being displayed. So the unlock symbol means that the internal synthesizer that's supposed to lock to its own internal reference is unlocked. So the PLL is not working. Why? And I'm not sure. That was one of the things that was wrong with it. And the other thing that was wrong with it is that as soon as you enable the output, it will tell you that the output is unlevel. So let's say I set the frequency to 1 gigahertz and I set the power to 0 dBm and I enable the output there you go, and you see as soon as I enable the output it says unlevel and unlevel in this context means that the internal, uh, internally it measures the output power that's coming out of the output board and if that doesn't match what it expects it will tell you that it's not producing a leveled output meaning it's not reaching the power that it's supposed to have so the internal uh, mechanism detects that and tells you that. So it has two main problems and unfortunately these are actually unrelated to each other so the unlock problem and the unlevel problem are two different things. Now whether there's a single cause that's causing both of these uh, I don't know it's hard to say but this is exactly how the unit was advertised so I expect to see these two problems uh, so that's fine. So well what else can we do? Well I have looked online for the schematic and the block diagram of this unit and I couldn't find it for this particular model but I have found it for the model, the newer version of this and it's supposed to be fairly similar anyhow the schematic is not available even for the newer unit but the block diagram is available so we can use some of that to figure out what's wrong with this so the, well, the next step would be to take it apart so this thing has a, a bunch of screws at the back with these locations where the legs used to be. So I just took those out and I, this cover should uh, slide off. Let me see. There we go. Take this thing out. And I went ahead. And... There we go. So you can see that this is 
how all of these guys come apart. And we've seen something like this before where I took apart the other uh, HP synthesizer for repair and they are all really well shielded. So it has a top plate that shields uh, the motherboard and the inside so everything underneath here is shielded. And there is on the side another panel, yes it's on this side, which has all the cards in there. And in here there is actually written which slot has what inside it. So if I were to turn this over, so it says that the the top card is the output board, there's nothing in the second slot, and then the reference board and the synthesizer board are also in here. So the synthesizer board would be the board that's failing that would give you the error signal that says it's unlocked, and the output board potentially would be what's faulty that gives you the unlevel. Uh, the reference board has just a 10 megahertz an oven controlled crystal oscillator inside it that is just generating the reference. So that, if that was failing, you would see a, you know, an, a non-existent reference error of some kind. So that's not on, so that's probably not an issue. But anyhow, let's go ahead, let me take all these screws off and uh, see what's inside. So here it is, I took the top panel off here and I took the panel in here where the cards are so I can actually see uh, the three modules that are plugged in here. I'll show you that later. So now the motherboard is exposed. Up here is the power supply. You can see the power supply cables come out. Uh, it's fully shielded also. I don't think this power supply has any issues uh, simply because everything else seems to boot up uh, you know, well, the display comes on. So I don't think it's the power supply directly that's broken. But anyhow, it does have a lot of voltages that come out of it. So maybe one of those is bad and the other voltages that are necessary to power other things are okay. But we can check that later. So let me take the take this off and show you a little bit more on what we have inside. So here's the motherboard, a very basic construction, a lot of uh, surface mount components, you know, some memory here, some the firmware here, the main processor here, which I think is a Motorola processor. It has a bunch of empty connectors and these empty connectors are, are typically used for upgrades which this unit doesn't have. So if you have for example a mechanical attenuator, the mechanical attenuator would sit right here and it will plug in there and you can you can actually hear it when you change the output power as the mechanical attenuator is engaged. This one does not have a mechanical attenuator. It has an analog one. Um, a solid state one. So yeah, the other things on the board, uh, there's a big connector in the middle, I have no idea what that is for. There's a backup battery, a bunch of dip switches, which I suppose are some settings, so I'm not gonna touch it at the moment. Uh, the power supply connector comes through here. There's a bunch of other uh, DC-DC converters here based on the LT1170 linear technology IC. So you can see the components that are around the linear technology IC are used for the DC-DC reg uh, regulations. There's a bunch of inductors in here for example. Uh, let's see what else is in here that's interesting. Uh, this unit out here, which is connected directly to the output, so the, the output board sits right under here. And this guy, this uh, coax cable is right the out, this coming out of the output board. And it comes down through here, goes inside this unit, and comes out of this unit. I believe this is the an analog attenuator and the reverse power protection unit bolt uh, in here, I think. So one potential problem could be that this unit is bad. Although, I'm not sure if the unlevel is detected at this point. I believe the unlevel signal is generated directly from the output board. So unfortunately, I don't think it's this thing that's bad. This doesn't know whether the output is good or bad. It's the output board itself internally that detects that because the ALC loop is inside that. Anyhow, so you know, there's nothing else interesting uh, on the motherboard itself. There's also a back of this, I believe. I think there's something at the back of this. Must be some components there too, which we can take a look at. There was there's also a shield on the other side of this. Uh, now the other interesting thing in here is there's a bunch of LEDs in here. Now I happen to know that these LEDs uh, represent uh, some state of the DSP that's running inside the microprocessor. So if the display, the front display, which is here, if it doesn't come on and you have no way of knowing what's wrong with it, these LEDs display a certain hexadecimal number that represents a failure inside the digital unit, the DSP unit that's in here. So if the processor is failing, it will display an error and then you can go and look, look up that error and find out what's wrong with it. So it's like a debugging tool, very useful. I don't think that this is going to display anything that it display a particular error because the, the front panel comes on and anyhow, so it, the DSP is at least working. I think all the problems are from the analog RF circuits. There is another bunch of LEDs in here, which is also very useful. Next to each of those LEDs, you can see there's a number. 
Let me just zoom in a little bit more. Here you go. And those numbers next to those LEDs represent different power supply voltages that are present on the board. So there's 5.2 volt, 12 volt, 32 volt, minus 15, plus 15, plus 9, and so on. So all those voltages, if any of those voltages have failed or if any of them is not up to spec, those LEDs will not light up. So that tells you that, hey, there is a power supply failure. So that, uh, when you turn this on, I suspect all those lights, they should be all on. If they are not, then you have to start thinking about what's wrong with it. So, like I said, I do have the block diagram, but I don't have the schematic. So let's just plug it in, turn it on, look at the lights, make sure everything's okay, and um, just take it one step at a time. If you can't find anything wrong with it by just fiddling around with it a little bit, then we'll start digging deeper. Okay, I've plugged it in, so let's turn it on. There we go. Okay, I see that this guy is uh, showing something, but it hasn't boot up fully yet. So let's see what happens. Okay, there it is. What is it doing now? All right, so now it's fully booted. It's at its main display. So okay, so this is showing a, a counter. This I actually now remember. So this is supposed to show a counter if everything is okay with the DSP. So you can see it's counting in binary, or I should say it's counting down in binary. So I, it will continue to do that. And then when everything, when it finishes, it will start over, I think. Let's see. Yeah, let's keep going. Come on, blah, blah, blah. Now all of them will go on except this last one. Yeah, so it's counting down. So I think it's just going to continue to do that. And then it will uh, reset and start back with all the lights back on. So this actually is a good sign. This means there is nothing particularly wrong with it. But oh, aha, look at that. That's actually a good news right here. So. All these lights are on except one of them and the number in it let me see it says plus 9 volts so the 9 volt power supply in fact is not working that was uh, unexpected I thought all these lights would come on so the plus 9 volt power supply is therefore not needed for the display or any other stuff but it is possible that the plus 9 volt supply is needed for the components that have that are showing failure although it would be unusual to have uh, the 9 volt fail. Maybe one of the, well, there's two possibilities. Either the 9 volt power supply is bad on the motherboard, or there is a short circuit in one of the modules that is inside the unit. So for example, uh, the modules that I'm talking about are these guys. These are the, this is the output board, this is the reference board, and this is the synthesizer board. So if one of these guys has a short circuit in it, the power supply, will be shorted and it will be disabled because they all have protection and then the light will turn off so let's uh, let's try that idea let's take all the boards out and see what happens if the light comes back on okay i will power down the unit i'm going to take out these these boards there we go so i pulled them just partially out so yeah let me take one of them out so you can see so they interface with the motherboard through these connectors and this one has a little RF connector too. This is the synthesizer board. So this is the synthesized signal that comes in uh, into the board. So you can see that uh, right here, this guy actually plugs into the motherboard. So I'm not going to take them all the way out. I'm just going to make sure that they're disconnected from the motherboard. There we go. There's another one. And the output board. There we go. So if I pull the output board, actually, let me show you this one too. Here it is, you see, this is the connector that connected to the coax that I showed you on the other side. That's how the output uh, signal gets to the front panel. And there's two other ones where the synthesizer, let me see, where does it come from? Yeah, the synthesizer input the, uh, goes into the output board from here. So let me put this back in here so we don't forget. There we go. So the three boards are back in their place. So let's power it on and see what happens. Here are the lights. Ah, look at that. The plus 9 volt came back on. Well, that's not necessarily a good thing because it means that there is a short circuit, possibly, potentially a short circuit inside one of those boards. So what I have to do now is I'm going to plug in the boards one at a time, turn it back on, find out which of the boards has the short, which of these three boards is actually causing the 9 volt uh, supply to uh, be turned off to, so we can that, that way we can find out which board is potentially faulty so I'm gonna go ahead and do that I will just do this three things in a row and I'll let you know of the result in a second okay so I plugged in the reference board but I left the other two boards out 
And since I don't think the reference board has a problem, I don't think the reference board is going to have any effect on the 9 volt supply. So let's turn this back on. There you go, see? So the 9 volt supply is still on even though the reference board is plugged in. So I'm going to try the, one of the other two boards now. Okay, so I discovered something interesting. I discovered that both the output board and the synthesizer board cause the 9 volt supply to be turned off. So therefore there's only two possibilities. Either both of these had a short in them because both of them caused the 9 volt to disappear or that there is actually something wrong with the 9 volt supply on the motherboard to begin with. Now I'm a little bit hesitant to think that both the output board and the reference board the synthesizer board and the output board both have the short on the same supply because they receive many supplies. They, they have plus or minus 15, 5 volts and so on, but they both short the 9 volt. It's a little bit unlikely that they have the exact same failure on both of them. Unless, of course, something happened to the 9 volt supply from the motherboard that damaged both of them. But either way, I suspect the 9 volt supply on the motherboard to be bad. So let's take all the boards out, flip this thing over, and measure, actually I don't, think, I don't think I need to flip it over, I think I, I saw here, oh, there's a glare on here, I don't think you can see it, but if you look closely, there is a pad here, labeled right there, there's a pad, pad there labeled 9 volts in the center of the screen, and a pad labeled minus 5.2, so I can actually measure it, and I can go ahead and try and trace that, and find out where that 9 volt supply is actually generated. It could be generated in one of these DC-DC converters, it's possible, but I don't know which one. So I'm going to try and fill around with it and find out where the 9 volt supply actually is generated. I'm going to take all the boards out and then we can look at and see if the 9 volt supply is actually healthy. So here we go. This is where the three boards used to sit. I put the three boards down here, so I've, I've taken them all out. So now you can see that where the, where the connections were made and how the connections were uh, made to the motherboard from up there. So now there is nothing in there, so the 9 volt supply will light up if I turn it on, but I'm going to try and trace it and find out where it is being generated from. So let's try that. Let me flip this guy over. And I'm, I've already removed some of the screws from back here uh, so that we can make it, we can remove it easily. Where is the remaining screws? I think there's one here. That's just going to expose the back of the motherboard. Whoa. Let's see. Oh, there we go. Oh, actually, there is not that many components here. I thought there would be more. But uh, there isn't that much stuff there. There's actually only a bunch of, uh, just a little bit, there's a bunch of tantalum capacitors that are sitting at the back. Uh, there's a few little ICs and a bunch of tiny passives, but really there's like, not much in here. There is one component in here. Let me see. The number is not very clear. Oh, it's a TIP-122. I know what that is. A TIP-122 is, a, is an uh, NPN Darlington uh, bipolar transistor. So it, it could be used in voltage regulator. So we have to check that. I'm not sure if, what this does here, but anyhow, we'll figure it out. Uh, so there's the only other component that's back here. That's uh, actually a through hole. Everything else is surface mount. And now you can see that this connection right here is the LCD connection. This connection in here is the front panel buttons. So the buttons are controlled from here. So that everything is back here is fairly visible. And I see a lot of... Uh, this whole thing is actually upside down. Let me flip it over. There we go. Man, these things are heavy. Oh. There was a lot of dust in here. I, I actually had to vacuum this whole thing uh, between two tapes. So, uh, there we go. So now it's right side up. So if you look, I don't know if it's visible on the camera, but there's a bunch of test points. There's ADC in, uh, ABUS, RTN. ABUS is analog bus. There's a DAC output. I don't know what that is. There's a 5.2 volt here. I'm looking for the 9 volt one. Hopefully the 9 volt one also shows up at the back. And yeah, I'll have to search for it, see if I can find the 9 volt uh, reference voltage here. There's the 10 volt here, uh, minus 12, plus 12, plus uh, 32. That must be the highest voltage that's available actually on on here. Uh, there's minus 6. Ah, there it is. I found it. Plus 9 volts right there. So there's a test point with plus 9 volts and all the other supplies. So let me put in a multimeter, we'll plug it in, power it on, and just measure a bunch of supplies. And actually here, that's interesting to see too, you can sneak into the... 
you can l sneak in a little bit into the power supply with the, uh, this nice, you can see they've put a lot of uh, glue in here to hold these components down. So this is very nicely made. I don't think Agilent makes their own power supplies. Uh, at least I've never one, seen one that's branded Agilent. It's just probably uh, bought from somewhere else. So anyhow, I hope I don't have to open that because I don't think uh, I would want to figure out that power supply debugging and one of these things wouldn't be that interesting. But anyhow, let's see. Let's see if we can find out what is wrong on this motherboard. Okay, so I've plugged this into the power, turned it on, and uh, I'm using my trusty Fluke 289 sitting here, so I'm sure you can see the number. I have the, uh, the positive terminal in my hand and the negative terminal I've grounded because I, I've checked and I think all the, all the grounds of the boards are actually connected together. So that, that makes it convenient. So let's measure some voltages and see if they match what they're supposed to. Let's measure something that we know works. Uh, for example, let's measure the plus 32 volt right there. There you go. Plus 32 volts. It's actually quite dead on. That must be directly coming from the supply at the top. So to measure some of the other voltages. Here's the 5.2 volt supply. Perfect. 5.2. Let's measure the minus 6 volt supply. There is minus 6 volt right there. That one's okay. And uh, there is here's the plus 9 volt. Let's see. It's, it's 9 volts. So it's, it really is 9 volts there, but it doesn't work when I plug in the boards. Now, I would want to measure to see if the 9 volt supply is shorted uh, with the boards connected. Because I don't know exactly which connectors on the board carry the 9 volt supply. But I also wanted to find out what generates the 9 volt supply. So I'm going to start uh, fiddling around. I was actually looking at this portion before I started recording. So if you look here, and one of the so I know that the terminal so this is the, the I believe the base this is the collector okay and this is the there it is 9 volt okay so okay so I know the tip 122 here is what is generating the 9 volt supply and I know this because the collector of that is sitting at 12 volts its base is sitting at 10.1 and its emitter is sitting at 9 volts. So this is a voltage reg regulator with a Darlington transistor. Now I wanted to, uh, since uh, since we were talking about you know fixing the circuit, I thought maybe we could take a look at the Darlington transistor for some of you guys who may not know what a Darlington is and what is its purpose is and what, how it works and why, why do people use, use Darlingtons at all. I prepared a couple of uh, slides here that I wanted to go over, talk a little bit about the theory about how Darlington devices work and how you can make a voltage regulator from a Darlington transistor and then we'll come back to this. So hopefully this will also serve a purpose other than just a repair. So here's a biasing schematic of a very simple circuit. This is a, a single NPN bipolar transistor that I have put into a, a biasing circuit where there is a collector current being forced into the device and there is a base voltage that provides the correct base voltage for the device in order to stay in the active region. So if you're familiar with bipolar devices, you know that the collector current in a bipolar device is beta times larger than its base current. So the current gain from the base of a bipolar transistor when it's in the active region to the collector is beta times. That's the current gain of a bipolar. Don't mistake that with its transconductance. The transconductance is a different concept. So the base, the base, uh, the beta of the transistor itself is a very important parameter because it tells us that we can provide very little base current to the device and get a very large corrected current if the beta is large enough. Typically for a high-speed uh, bipolar device, whether it's discrete or if it's integrated, the beta is at least 100. Integrated beta, integrated circuits beta for high-speed uh, bipolars can be 500 or more. So. For a discrete one that you can pick up, like a tiny little um, NPN device, th those guys will have a beta of about 100 or so. So that's good because it means that if I want, for example, to deliver 100 milliamps to a load, I only need to put in 1 milliamp into the base in order to achieve that. Now the emitter current is beta plus 1 times the base because the emitter also absorbs the base current also. But anyhow, I just wrote that for completion. 
So that is good because it allows us to put a large current in the load by providing a small current in the base. But if I want to put a very large current into uh, some load, let's say I want to put in uh, 10 amps, for example, then I cannot use a high-speed device. I have to use a, a power transistor, a power NPN. Now, power NPN devices have much higher breakdown voltages and can deliver much higher currents. But they do that at a cost of beta because the beta for a power transistor due to semiconductor physics uh, issues is much lower than a beta for a high-speed transistor. So the beta can be, for example, 10. But if the beta is 10 and I want to put 10 amp through something, that means I am going to have to put 1 amp through the base. Well, putting one amp through the base is not easy. I can't drive that from a, a low voltage or a low power analog circuit anymore. I'm going to need something else to provide the one amp. So then that device becomes, well, a little bit useless because the, the, the one amp base current is difficult to provide. But the advantage of a single transistor here can be seen because the collector to emitter voltage, the minimum collector to emitter voltage required to keep a single NPN device in the active region, the, the minimum collector to emitter voltage is just the saturation voltage of the device. So I just need to make sure that the, across these two terminals of the device, I have at least about 0.1 to 0.2 volts, which is a typical uh, VCE SAT for a bipolar device. Well, let's say I want to make a power transistor now, and I, wanna, I need to be able to uh, provide one amp to the base because the beta is small. Well, what if I just provide that base current with another transistor? I put another transistor here whose, ho whose whole purpose is to just provide the base current to the second transistor. Well, that's the Darlington transistor itself. So aside from the bipolar device itself, which was invented at Bell Labs, the Darlington was also invented at Bell Labs in, 19, in the 1950s by Darlington himself. And that's where I work, actually. So I walk by the room where these things were invented in every morning uh, when I go to work. So, uh, so here's a schematic for a Darlington device itself. So the Darlington device is essentially, as I explained, two bipolar uh, devices for an NPN Darlington where the base current of the second bipolar is provided by the emitter current of the first one. So this allows you to now provide the, the, current, the current through the, this guy's base now comes through the emitter of the second one, which then has another gain of beta. So the collector current here is beta times larger than the base current. And the collector current here is now beta, beta times larger than this base current. So this base current is actually much smaller than the base current of the second one by a factor of beta. And this is the symbol for it, so I've drawn the schematic over again. Now if you were to go through the equations, you can see if you just write down all the currents and write all the betas and just work through the algebra, you see that the collector current in here, this collector current, when compared to this base current, it has this, has this relationship where the beta the effective beta of the combination of these two devices, so the effective beta of the Darlington device itself, is now beta 1 plus beta 2 plus the product of the two betas. And if the betas are, you know, sufficiently large, let's say 10 or so, then you can just approximate it by beta 1 plus beta 2. And that's what typically people say, that the Darlington configuration is like a beta multiplier. It multiplies the beta of these two devices. And this is all because I'm providing the base current of the second one from the emitter of the first one, which has another beta gain before it. So that's great. So why don't we build every transistor as a Darlington transistor, if it is going to provide us with such a great beta multiplication? Well, the reason for that, one of the real disadvantages, and again, as always in, in electronics, especially in analog electronics, there is always a disadvantage. As soon as you gain something, you lose something else. So if you remember, I showed this one. I said that the minimum collector emitter voltage for a single bipolar device is just VCE SAT. It means I can bring this voltage all the way down to 0.1 or 0.2 volts, and this device will still be in the active region. So I can make low voltage devices, but or circuits. But I cannot do that here because the reason is is now I have another base emitter voltage which I have to support, or I rather this one. So the minimum voltage that this guy can have across it is still 0.1 volts, the VCE SAT. But now there is another. VBE sitting here and VBE is large it could be 0.7 volts or so so the minimum voltage now from here to here is the VBE of the of the first one which is the same as the VBE of the second one um, actually sorry let me start over so the overall VBE 
which is from here to here, is now the VBE of the first one plus the VBE of the second one. So now you have, your VBE is much larger than it used to be before. It's now twice as big as it used to be before. The base emitter voltage of this device was only one VBE, but the base emitter voltage of Darlington is two VBEs. So that's the first disadvantage in terms of voltage. The second one is that the minimum voltage you can have across here is now the base emitter voltage of this one plus the VC sat of the second one. So I cannot bring this voltage down as low as I could before because I will saturate this device, or rather this device. So now I have to put at least VBE plus VC sat. So before it used to be 0.1 volts, now it's 0.7 plus 0.1 volts. So I've lost another VBE in my voltage headroom. So my voltage headroom is now much smaller than it was before, but I have gained a lot of beta. There are other disadvantages to this. The other disadvantage is that this combination of devices is going to be inherently much slower than a single bipolar device. Because this single bipolar device, I can turn this device on and off, or I can put a high speed signal through it and amplify it because I only need to modulate this base voltage. But here, when I modulate this base voltage, this base voltage has to in turn modulate another base voltage before the collector current actually changes at all. So the delay from uh, the inherent phase shift, the delay from this base to this collector is going to be much larger than the delay that you will see from this base to this collector, which then translates to having a larger time constant, which then translates to slower circuit. And the bipolar devices cannot, the Darlington bipolar devices can also be more unstable because of that in a feedback loop, because of the fact that they're slower. And there are other issues with it too, but these are really the main disadvantages. So well, having said all of that, how can we build a voltage regulator from a Darlington transistor at all? And uh, I don't know the circuit diagram in the source that you're working on, but I can give you an example of how you can build a regulator using a Darlington transistor, a very basic one. So this is an example of that right here. So here's our Darlington transistor, you can see right there. You can put your unregulated DC input here, and you will get your regulated voltage across the road. Well, how is that possible? Well, if I use a Zener diode here, then the Zener diode will have a constant voltage across it, reasonably constant voltage across it, if the current through it doesn't change very much. And that's what Darlington devices do really well. If I change the current through my load by a whole lot, the base current through the Darlington doesn't change very much because the Darlington has the advantage of having beta times beta effective uh, current gain, which is great. So this means that I can put a lot of current through my load, a regulated load here, and I will be able to maintain this voltage to be fairly constant. So the output voltage here, this V out, is actually equal to the Zener voltage diode minus VBE minus VBE, so minus two VBEs. So this voltage will be equal to this, and you can build this for yourself very easily and try it out. You can pick a Zener diode voltage, I don't know, pick a Zener diode, let's say pick a three volt Zener diode, and then you will have 2 VBE, which would be about 1.4 volts, then you can get 1.6 volt regulator right there. That's just easy as that. Now, this is not perfect. This is not a very good regulator, but it's a really cheap, simple, and quick one to build. The disadvantage of this is that the voltage in the Zener diode does change a little bit uh, with the current through it. Not so much, but really the other main advantage is that this is really temperature sensitive because both the Zener, vo Zener voltage across this and the base emitter voltage are both function of temperature and they, you, therefore the, the regulated voltage will drift as temperature will drift. So this has to be a very temperature stable circuit. But anyhow, I don't know if this is what they're using, probably not, but either way, uh, this is an example of how you can build a, a Darlington uh, regulator. So anyhow, so we, we really went off course here, but I wanted to talk a little bit, since we, we, we were talking about Darlington's and trying to find a problem with it, I thought it would be interesting to talk a little bit about some of the theory behind it. So what I sus so it is possible that the Darlington transistor that's in the source is damaged in such a way that it has created a semiconductor ohmic contact inside it. So it's partially damaged, but not completely. So it's able to generate 9 volts, but it's not able to, to give you any current if the, if the devices have degraded in some way. So I have an interesting way to test that theory. So let's put it together. It's a little bit an unusual way, but let's put it together and see if we can test the hypothesis that the regulator works when it's not under load. But as soon as you load it, it will stop working. Let's try it out. Okay, so here's my plan. My plan is to, to load the 9-volt supply 
artificially from outside and see if it can maintain the 9 volt regular voltage that it's supposed to. Now I can do that with a resistor but I thought it would be more fun to use the programmable electronic load here because I can program this to take a constant current from the uh, from the regular itself. So I can say, you know, take 50 milliamp, take 100 milliamp, and more and more and more, and see at what point does the regular actually fail. And here I have the, uh, the multimeter again, so we can measure the different voltages at the same time. So here's the two terminals that are connected to my, uh, to my DC load there. I, I, I built this cable a while back. So uh, I'm going to ground one side by just connecting it to, you know, somewhere in the case. There we go. Make sure it's nice and snug. There it is. So you can it's a little bit off the camera. Let me see if I can fix that. There we go. So anyway, I'm grounding this one up here. And here's the positive terminal. And right now I have taken all the boards out. So there's no board inside the unit. So therefore when I turn it on, the 9 volt should work because it's not under load at all. So let's turn it on. There it is. So I know that the output is on the, the leftmost pin. So I'm measuring that, and there it is. You can see on the multimeter there that we are reading nine volts exactly. So it's not under load, it's working. So let me turn it back off. I'm gonna use one of these uh, little uh, hooks to grab onto the regulator, like so, because it's, uh, this, uh, this alligator clip is too large to touch that and I don't wanna short anything else. So anyhow, so I'm just gonna connect that guy back to here like so. So right now I have not programmed anything into the constant current so I'm just going to put it onto, I'm going to click on I set so I don't know let's try uh, let's try something small uh, let's say point zero point one amp and enter. There it is. So it's set to point one amp. So it's going to try and take a constant hundred milliamp from the load itself. Right now it's showing zero because it is not, uh, uh, it doesn't have, it's not powered on yet. So as soon as I power it on, I should read nine volts here. There you go, perfect, nine volts. Now I'm gonna load it by turning it on. And then we will see what voltage we see here. It should still be nine volts because I think that if you're gonna use a, a, a tip like this, uh, a transistor like this, you wanna provide a lot of current. So I'm, 100 milliamps should be very safe. It should be able to give much more than that. There you go. Oh, look at that. There it is. Look, at 100 milliamp, it's already down to 6.7 volts. So it's not even able to deliver um, 100 milliamps from 9 volts. But let's measure the other voltages. So the voltage on the collector should be fixed. There you go, 12 volts. So that collector voltage is, ah, it's getting really hot. So actually, it might be, or it might be dead because it is really, really hot also. So it is, um, so the collector voltage is still at 12 volts but the emitter voltage is down to 6.7. So I suspect the base voltage must have come down quite a bit. Yes, and it has. It has come down to 7.9 volts. So the difference between the voltage you're reading on the multimeter and the voltage you're reading on the DC load is the VBE, the two VBEs of the Darlington transistor we talked about. So let me increase the load a little bit and see what happens. Let's go to 0 0.2. 0 0.2 amps, enter. Ah, it's, there you go, it's already down to 3.7 volts. So it's collapsing. And okay, the collector voltage is still 12 volts. That means the 12 volt supply is good. Anyhow, I, was, I didn't think that was a problem anyway. Yeah, and then the, the base voltage has come down to 4.7 volts. So it could be that whatever is connected to the base of the Darlington is the problem, or it could be that the Darlington is bad and it has a heavily degraded beta and therefore it cannot withstand any current. So as soon as you put current to it, there's a huge voltage drop across the transistor itself, which shouldn't be the case, but it is, and that's probably what's causing the issue. So there you go, we got to use a DC load. Uh, I can try, let me see at, at, at what point it starts to fail. Let me put less current in it. So let's try 0 0.05, so 50 milliamps. Okay, so it can do 50 milliamps. So at 50 milliamps, it can still do nine volts, but as soon as you go above that, I guess it starts to collapse. Let me try 300, oops, 0 0.3, enter, 2.2, so yeah, 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 it's supposed to be 9 volts, so it's completely collapsing as soon as you try to draw any current from it at all. So now we have a suspect problem. I, I think that the Darlington is dead. Now there is one other thing I can do. 
which is also a little bit uh, non-conventional, I can apply an external uh, 9 volt to this. Uh, so basically bypass the Darlington altogether. I can force that node to 9 volts using an external power supply uh, to see uh, if everything comes back to life. So I could either do that or I could just replace the Darlington transistor with something else. But anyhow, let's do that since I just thought of it. Let me, let's use an external power supply and force this node, which is supposed to be at 9 volts, to 9 volts. Force it all the way up to 9 volts and see if the errors that this guy used to generate, if they're still there. And I'm going to put all the boards back into the unit. So we are really going to test it under its full load. So I'm going to put all the three boards back in, connect this to the supply, and see what happens. So let me set that up. So here's our, our new setup. So what I've done is that I have connected directly a wire, actually two wires, to the output of this voltage regulator, the Darlington, to, to its emitter. And I am connecting one of those directly to my Regal DP1116A power supply. So you can see that this is one of the features of the Regal supply that I really like is that uh, it, it tells you when the output is not enabled, it tells you what voltage is present at the node. So it's reading back the voltage. It's a very useful feature, and I hope they, hopefully they will add it to the other model too. Uh, so it, I'm reading 1.859, and here, if you look at my multimeter, which I'm also connecting to the collector, is also reading the same voltage. Now, the reason I'm measuring this again here is because if there is a lot of current going through, there's going to be a voltage drop across the, resist across the, the resistive... Uh, nature of the wire itself. So I want to make sure that that voltage is exactly 9 volts and I can raise it uh, to compensate for a drop. So uh, uh, let's, uh, well let me show you first that that this the instrument is actually still has those errors. Um, let me see, I can't really see the display of the camera. Here we go, so it, it does say unlevel here and it says unlock here. So it's, it's still failing basically because the 9 volt supply is not connected. But all the boards have been put back into the unit. So it's back to its original uh, configuration. So let's go ahead and, and try this. So let me raise this voltage. I'm going to set it to uh, start with 5 volts. And I'm going to enable it and see what happens. Uh, okay, okay, 5 volts is okay. So at 5 volts, it's now drawing 700 milliamps, which is much, much higher than anyhow, that anything that the uh, the regular it could provide, but five is not what we want. So let's go to nine, seven, six, seven, eight, and nine. Wow, 1.7 amps. I hope that's correct. I hope I'm not damaging something else. But 1.7 amp is being uh, supplied. But you can see that the, the voltage here is 8.8 .8 volts, but this is saying nine volts. And the difference is because of the wire. So that's why I had the wire in the first place. So let me go up by another 200 millivolts. One, two, there you go, 8.999. That's 9 volt right there. Now it's taking 1.826 amps, so 16.8 watts of power. Now let's see. Let me clear all the errors. Let me see if they come back. Uh, clear. Ah! <laughs> now take a look at this. Check this out. Both of those errors are gone. The unlock is gone, the unlevel is on, gone, and the output is turned on, and if I go under error info, no errors in the queue. That's it, it doesn't generate those errors anymore. I, I don't know if it's working, I don't know if it's generating signal, we have to connect it to the spectrum analyzer to see, but the errors are certainly gone uh, with the external power being applied. So that is uh, already a huge step forward. That means that it is possible to fix this unit if we are going to be able to fix uh, the regular problem. So the next step is I'm going to look through my parts to see if I have a replacement for that and then uh, try and remove it and put another one in and see if it works on its own. And if it does, then we will connect it to the spectrum analysis to see if it works. But you can see that applying the external voltage, forcing that voltage up is actually working. The errors have gone away. I hope that there is an output. I don't know if there is, but as, especially because he has suffered a big shock and you can see the connectors were broken. But let's try it out. That's a good step forward. Okay, here we are on the other side of the lab. And uh, I have, uh, I'm going to use my uh, Heiko soldering iron. But for that, I'm, I also have a box of components here. I was digging through it 
to find uh, an NPN equivalent NPN, uh, and I was looking, and I think I actually saw there it is. There is actually a, a tip 122, which is the exact component that's there. I happen to have it. This is an NPN. The the uh, the PMP version of it. Uh, which is the tip 147 was actually used if you remember in the magnetic levitation experiment as well as the spark generator the Tesla coil experiment uh, that I did long ago I uh, used a, a Darlington in both of those experiments for the reasons of the beta multiplication but anyhow so put that aside here's our replacement component I don't think I've ever used this so it should be functional now it's a matter of uh, we're getting this this one out um, so what I'm going to do, so this actually is screwed onto the chassis and they're using the chassis as a heat sink to, to absorb the, the heat from this component. So now I, I'm going to cut the leads off of it, uh, you know, recently up here, I'm going to try to cut them not too short so we can maybe later on figure out what's wrong with the component, but I'm just going to snip these guys off like so and go ahead and Oh man, That's, there we go. Remove that screw carefully. It has, ah, it has a, ah, maybe it's a plastic washer. But then, yeah, I think there should be some thermal material there that I want to make sure I don't disturb so much. Wow, it's really stuck. Oh, there we go. Oh, there it is. Okay, so there is a, uh, some a thermal pad underneath it. Uh, I think it's thermal putty or some kind of a conductive material. It's not coming off, but it's. But anyway, I'm not going to disturb it. So here it is. There it is, and been removed. And now I'm going to have to unsolder the three pins. That's pretty boring stuff. So I'll just unsolder them and uh, turn the camera back on. Anyhow, the camera is kind of in my way. So I'll be right back. And here it is. The uh, oop. I don't think I can focus there. Come on. There it is. It's a replaced component. The new one, all soldered in. That was nothing fancy. And the old one that was taken out. So, now the moment of truth. We have to plug it in and see if it works. And here it is. I have plugged it in. And we will turn it on and see if all the lights come on. There we go. Fantastic. There it is. It seems to work. The lights are back on. And I am sure that means that the error messages are gone because the 9 volt supply is now working. And it's working with all the boards inside. So it is back to normal. Now I'm just going to connect it to the spectrum analyzer and see if it generates a signal. And then we're set. We can close it back up. Oh, actually, well, before I close it back up, I have to replace these two connectors which were uh, damaged during transport. Maybe I can just straighten it, although I don't think so. I probably have to replace it. But anyhow, we'll find out. Let's plug it into some test equipment. Here we go. I'm using my Regal DSA-1030A to measure the spectrum. That's my cat. So we're also getting a free cat scan. And uh, I've connected the, uh, the spectrum analyzer directly to, uh, let me lower this camera, right here. So I've connected it directly to the output of the source itself. So the source is connected with a long SMA cable directly to the input. So what I'm going to do is let's dial in some settings. Uh, let's say frequency 1 gigahertz, amplitude 0 dBm, just classic. And voila, there it is. You can see right there on the spectrum. I can turn the output. Let me get this thing back up. Zoom in onto the spectrum analyzer so we can make some measurements. It's unfortunately a glare. I'm trying to avoid the glare from the ceiling lamp. There we go. There we go. Sorry about that. Here it is. So let me change the uh, level, reference level to 10 dBm. Uh, where's the black space? 10 dBm. There it is. So I can do a peak search. So you can see the peak is at exactly at 1 gigahertz and it's sitting at minus 0.88 dBm. I've set the source to 0 dBm, but it's completely reasonable to assume that this long SMA cable that I'm using has at least that much loss. So let's try a different frequency. I'm going to just change the frequency by 100 megahertz at a time. There we go. 
you can see perfect moves up let's go to exactly three gigahertz at the very end so it's at the very very end of the screen and oh it the, the peak search cannot find it let me go to 2.9 peak and that's a bug uh, in the software at the regal i have to let them know about that so Anyhow, the 2.9 gigahertz now it has minus 2 dBm, so that's again the loss of the cable is frequency dependent, so that's totally reasonable. If I go to very low frequencies, let's say 100 megahertz, uh, 100 uh, megahertz like so, it should be more close to 0 dBm. So you see it's even closer to 0 dBm. It's actually over, so it's now it's producing too much power. So it's likely that either the source, uh, the source is probably producing a little bit more than it says. But uh, let me go back to 1 gigahertz. And at one gigahertz, we can change the amplitude. So we can go to minus 10. Let's do another peak search. Ah, this thing is calibrating up there. So it's warming up. Therefore, it has to calibrate itself after some time. There you go. So I see minus 11.06 is supposed to be minus 10. There are some losses again in the cables and so on. Uh, I can go to minus 20. There you go, minus 21.1. So it, it really seems to have no problems. It works perfectly well. And let's see, you can go more than 10, uh, 0 dBm. There you go, 10 dBm. Yeah, 9 dBm. Perfect. It, it, it works, and the second harmonic is uh, reasonably low. This is how these sources are. This is typical to have a second harmonic that's, that's large. Uh, it, it seems fully functional. Let's try uh, some, AM, uh, some FM modulation just to see if the modulation uh, stuff works as well. Let me go down to 0 dBm. Let's change the send the span to 100 megahertz. And let's center it at 1 gigahertz. So there's our tone. Uh, let me change the span to 10 megahertz, let's say. 10 megahertz, perfect. Let me reduce the resolution bandwidth. 10 hertz, 10 kilohertz. So let's uh, turn on uh, some uh, FM modulation just to see if the you know if the modulation actually works. So turn on the FM modulation. FM modulation on, and then the FM deviation. I'm gonna make it as large as possible. That is very large. That's 10 megahertz deviation at the rate of 400 hertz so the span is too small so let me make the span a bit bigger span larger 20 30 there it is there you go that's FM modulation for you it's doing exactly what it's supposed to it's been this this weird behavior that you see here is not from the source itself it has to do with the update rate of the instrument itself so if I change the instrument settings uh, to somewhat higher you can see that you will see the nice FM modulation index. Now, this is an FM modulation index with a, um, I believe, an internal 10 megahertz deviation at the rate of 400 hertz. And I believe that it is a sinusoid modulation index. So if I make it a square modulation index, you can see that you get much higher peaks. Again, that's normal, it's, it's expected uh, from. I can also do a triangular one, which will give you a much more flat uh, frequency response. So all of that stuff uh, makes sense. It works really well. I'm very happy with the source, and it seems to be fully functional. Now I'm just going to fix the connector, and uh, that's boring. It's just you know soldering some wire into the connector and seeing it work. But other than that, a good repair and a very interesting investigation. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. So now the unit is uh, repaired. I'm probably don't need it so I'm gonna think of uh, maybe selling it or do something with it after I fix the connectors but uh, as always I appreciate your uh, nice comments on the YouTube channel and on the website so please let me know what you thought of the video and I promise I'm gonna dedicate more time and making more videos now as some of you know my website has no advertisements in it and really the whole purpose of, of me having this website is, is not to really make any profit out of it it's purely my way of giving back to the community that I used so much while I was a student, while I was working on my PhD and on my bachelor's and so on. So this is kind of my way of giving back uh, what I took when I was younger. So hopefully you enjoyed it. 
and uh, you know leave some message and uh, contact me if you have any particular question maybe I'll try to do like a live session at some point like Dave does and then you can ask me questions about what it's like to work in the industry about research about uh, you know what are the different ways you can get involved in um, doing research in electronics this is the kind of work that I do and then you can ask me about some of other details about that so hopefully I'll see you again soon and I have some really cool exciting videos coming up I'm gonna try and put some time to make them so until next time